our freedom struggle is unique for the reasons you see number one it was the largest mass based struggle in the history of mankind india's freedom struggle unique for various reasons right number one the largest mass based struggle in the history of mankind undoubtedly this type of mass participation what do you mean by largest mass based struggle in the history of mankind it means the type of mass participation what you see in its quantity in its you know volume you don't see this type in any other revolution okay. french revolution is mass it's not mass it's mass okay. india's freedom struggle the largest mass based struggle undoubtedly in the history of mankind number 1 next number 2 our freedom struggle the most prolonged and protracted struggle most prolonged and protracted for independence by any country i mean india's struggle had taken maximum time you see african countries all got very quickly independence after world war 2 okay except of course south africa okay. south africa we don't consider it as you know a freedom struggle to continue you understand without a break okay mandela remained more in jail right freedom south africa's freedom struggle was not you know consistent right whereas india's freedom struggle had taken more than 6 decades it is the struggle that had taken maximum time okay for getting independence okay. american war of independence ended in 10 years 1774 to 1784 right indonesian freedom struggle okay. within 29 years 30 years indonesia got independence these struggles you see for the liberation of their countries okay they have taken time but no country like india india's struggle had taken maximum time more than 6 decades okay 1885 to 1947 nearly 6 decades more than 6 decades right. next third important thing is okay, of the freedom struggle is this is the struggle where you see okay, the extreme contradictions what do you mean by extreme contradictions perhaps i should say okay, no other movement in the history of mankind has seen this many contradictions what do you mean by contradiction class of idea is a contradiction right you want one thing and you don't want the same again a split ideology okay. what you want you go against it sometime right that is a contradiction what you do against what you want okay. you want something and you do against it that is a contradiction freedom struggle is contradictory is it yes definitely where do you see these contradictions i am explaining a very important point try to understand this we have contradictions in the beginning of the freedom struggle in the course of the freedom struggle right and in the end of the struggle contradictions you see in the beginning where do you see the contradiction in the beginning okay. there is a very good question given by upsc in the mains was india's freedom struggle the result of okay two contradictory policies of lord lytton and lord ripon okay. governor general lord lytton governor general lord ripon okay. both were responsible for the beginnings of india's struggle for independence 
Adams. Lord Lipton, Governor General, Lipton. This Governor General suppressed everything that was nationalistic. He followed a very repressive policy. Whereas his successor, Lord Ripon, was a progressive, liberal minded Ripon. Finally, both are responsible okay, for the beginnings of India's nationalist movement. Okay, hope you are understanding. One Governor General by a very conservative policy, depressive policy. The other governor general by a very progressive policy. Understand? Progressive, definitely. Liberal policy. Not even. Finally, both were responsible. One tried to suppress everything nationalistic. The other one tried to, I don't say deliberately encourage, but definitely his policies gave tremendous boost for nationalism. One discouraging, the other one in a way his policy is encouraging. Finally, India's struggle started that way. I will explain how it all happened later. I am making you people understand where do you see contradiction in the beginning, beginning of the freedom struggle. Right. Once the freedom struggle started, you see contradictions in the course of the freedom struggle. Where do you see contradictions once they started? You say, on one hand, our movement was for unity and integrity of India. In other words, our nationalist movement was for a united India. Nationalism. At the same time, you see, regionalism also started. Very interesting. This is what I meant by telling you contradiction. On one hand, we wanted a united India. At the same time, we are going against that concept. United India, on one hand, at the same time, you understand? Regionalism, regional forces. So contradiction was between nationalism versus regionalism. Where do you see regionalism? Classic example, I should say, the separate Andhra movement. In 1913 onwards, we have separate Andhra movement. Linguistic province, you know. Andhra the first, Andhra Rashtra, the first linguistic province. So, regionalism versus nationalism. I am not telling Andhras were not nationalistic, no. But definitely, you see the beginnings of regionalism. Finally, you see, we can't question the nationalist credentials. Everyone nationalist. Okay. But there is an element of regional tinge, regional color also. Okay. So, in the beginnings, after that, in the course also, you see contradictions. Contradiction, on one hand, India's nationalism. Okay. It's nationalistic. Okay. It's for unity. At the same time, you have regionalism. This is one contradiction once the movement started. Second important thing is, in India's nationalist movement, you also see secularism versus communalism. On one hand, our nationalist movement, definitely secular. It's very, very secular. We had gone to the extent of, say, in, you know, in, Hindu Muslim by by classic example non cooperation right. secular definitely okay. at the same time very interestingly you have communalism also starting okay. so question here is how to understand these things okay. they were clashing with each other okay. two forces contradictory okay. and clashing with each other Nationalism versus regionalism. Secularism versus communalism. That's what I'm telling you. In India's nationalist movement, you see these contradictions in the course of this story. Now come to the last part of the nationalist movement. In the last part of the nationalist movement, it was a movement 
right for unity and integrity of india we wanted a united india liberated india right but unfortunately you see in the last part you got a divided india we wanted a united india finally we got a divided india this was what at one point of time bos told gandhi gandhi freedom is what we take what not given freedom is what we take but not what is given okay that is freedom right finally we ended up with what a freedom given freedom or a taken freedom you know the answer we had to contend with a given freedom right given freedom not taken freedom we wanted a united india and finally we got you know a divided india these are all contradictions right i hope i could make it clear to you if you are not clear again when you can ask me if you have any doubt on this right then other important thing is yes india's nationalist movement okay the only struggle in the history of mankind unique undoubted only struggle in the history of mankind which recognized okay or which accepted not right recognized is not the right word which accepted okay, satyagraha ahimsa as the means to realize independence in other words we followed non violent means we accepted non violent means you mean entire freedom struggle non violent i am not telling you that even mahatma gandhi the you know prophet of non violence okay ahimsa satyagraha for him you see satyagraha ahimsa does not mean tolerating himsa or violence there is limit for everything that's why you see in the last stage of the movement with india movement okay gandhi had not accepted okay non violence satyagraha he gave these slogans do or die do or die okay the point here is all said and done our movement basically we believe in satyagraha ahimsa fundamentally we stand for these two ideas non violence satyagraha and non violence ahimsa right that way no movement ever talked about these things nowhere nowhere in the history you come across this slogan satyagraha ahimsa you find them only in india's history right so you see these are definitely unique aspects of india's nationalist movement this make india's nationalist movement something different okay one must remember these things why because you see if you don't know these things you get carried away by the idea okay that everything happened in india's nationalist movement was for freedom and all that Okay, I am making it clear this also. Everything what you are going to study as freedom struggle is not a struggle for freedom. Everything that happened in the nationalist movement was for was not for freedom. Right. There are so many contradictions. Okay, we are not clear about the ideas we are we use. Okay, self governance, Swaraj, dominion status, that. what that was swaraj for moderate what that was swaraj for extremist these are all entirely different ideas okay lot lot of you know ambiguity is there no clarity it also appears to us at some point or the other was it really a struggle for freedom is it a struggle for independence or is it for constitutional reforms did we ask british to leave india or we were asking for some constitutional reforms so these are valid questions also one must think about okay. this is all you know in the very beginning okay i just want to make you people understand the questions here right 
then where exactly the beginnings started? Beginnings for India's nationalist movement. Where do you see the beginnings? What are the otherwise, what are the factors and the forces for India's nationalism? When it comes to factors and the forces for India's nationalism, I must say the first and the foremost important factor, introduction of English education. English education, most important factor, first important factor. How do you say English education responsible for the beginnings of nationalism? If you remember, I told you, it's because of English education. Okay. You had, for the first time in modern India, educated Indian middle class. Okay. While discussing the reformist movements also, I told you, English education of T.B. Macaulay was responsible for very powerful ideas rationalism, humanism, empiricism. Consequent effect of that, you had middle class. This middle class absorbed these ideas. They were rationalistic, they were humanistic, and they were, you know, equally scientific in their temperament. They are ready to question everything. This was the class that provided leadership for India's nationalist movement and at the same time this was the class that led India's nationalist movement. Okay. I mean, you see, they are the ones who led reformist movements, that's why right they Most of the reformers, they are products of English education, right? And at the same time, English education gave us also class of nationalist leaders, right? So, you can't expect this to happen without English education. Okay. I mean, nationalism, the spirit of nationalism, okay, was finally the result of English education. Okay. If you remember, UPSC gave a question. Okay. What was the question in the mains? Okay. India liberated her fetters and bonds with Western hammers. That's the question. India liberated her fetters and bonds with western hammers. What were the western hammers? Western hammers means in what way English themselves helped Indians for the nationalist movement. Definitely you see here English education, number one. Okay. Next, number two, you see English provided us uniform civil administration. Uniform Civil Administration. Okay. With the 1833 Charter Act, centralization of administration, you know, legislation started. Okay. Governor General, Governor General of British India, laws made by Calcutta Council were applicable to all provinces of British India. Okay. I mean, you see, English introduced uniform administrative system. Right? This created a sense of unity. Okay. You mean there is no unity at all amongst Indians? Yes, let us accept that. Where was the unity? Unity was not there. At no point of Indian history, I told you remember, at no point of Indian history, India was ruled by one king, entire India. No. No Indian king ever conquered India and ruled. Our India's nationalism was okay, a developed one and it had taken quite a long time. And even today also, we had not emerged as a full-fledged nation as yet. We are making our best efforts to overcome certain problems. Right? It's a different area. The point here is, British definitely gave us okay, a sense of unity. Okay. Politically, they united us. Okay. Even though they are princely states, by and large, the most territorial part of India came under the control of the British. Secondly, they gave us a uniform civil administration. Okay. Third important thing is, okay, they had given us communication systems. Remember, drunk roads developed. 
railways developed, steamers introduced, post telegraphs, everything entered in modern India. Okay. It's because of this, the distance got reduced. Okay. We could interact very freely with the other people. Okay. Other people in sense within India. Distance narrowed down. Okay. This apart, you see the other important thing. British were responsible for growth of parliamentary formation, right? Was read out in the Allahabad Darbar by Lord Kani. Proclamation promised to promote Indians in the decision making process. Right? On the basis of the Queen's Proclamation, 1861 Indian Councils Act was passed, right? 1861 Indian Councils Act, a very important, you know, turning point here in the growth of democratic ideas and institutions. The Act provided for minimum of 8, maximum of 12 Indian members to be nominated to the legislative councils. Minimum of 8, maximum of 12 Indian members to be nominated to the legislative councils. First, first time, Indian members were now, you know, trained in the art of decision making. Okay. We are entering into the legislative councils. Remember Bombay, Madras, Kolkata legislative councils, they became the training grounds, they, they were the platforms for the early Indian leadership. Early Indian leadership very well trained in these legislative councils. Credit goes to the British. Then you see they also introduced progressive ideas, progressive reforms. I discussed this under Renaissance. Okay. Renaissance equally played an important role. Someone was asking the question the other day, in what way Renaissance inspired India's nationalist movement? Under Renaissance, you, have, you see reformist movements started, right? In the reformist movements, Brahmo Samaj, Raja Ramohan Rai, first two political activists, he generated a lot, lot of political consciousness. Ramohan Rai envisaged India, a progressive India, democratic India, liberal India. That's why you call Ramohan father of modern India, right? Then you see Arya Samaj. Arya Samaj gave these slogans Sudeshi and Swaraj. Remember, it was Arya Samaj first to give the slogans, Swadeshi and Swaraj. Right. Extremist slogans, they became the slogans for the extremist leaders, Swadeshi and Swaraj. Right. Swami Vivekananda and Renaissance, Vivekananda inspiring the youth to rededicate themselves for the cause of liberating India. So you can see here, the impact of the Renaissance, right? This apart, you see that I am giving the reasons, reasons for the beginnings of India's national system, right? the background, right? Then you see economic policies under the distress, economic policies under the distress. You remember economic policies, Jamindari settlement, permanent settlement, right? Raitwari, Mahalwari, Indian peasantry lost their customary and hereditary rights. Okay. Land revenue was pretty exorbitant, land tax. Peasantry became coolies. Jamindars lost their jamindaris. I told you, agriculture, agriculture was ruined. Okay. Then trade and commerce. Okay. Remember British policy? Deindustrialization. What was deindustrialization? A systematic destruction of native industry, handicraft industry, textiles industry. They are ruined by the British. So life turned quite hard. I mean, it turned very difficult for survival. Okay. Survival and subsistence levels got very badly affected okay, under the British colonialism. 
There was economic distress, unemployment increased phenomenally. You see, it was in this context, better you remember, there's a question given by UPSC. During the years 1867-68, okay, the per capita income of an Indian was what? How much was the per capita income? Okay. Who calculated this? Better you note down. Dadabai Naurochi, you remember, the grand old man of India, Dadabai, an expert on drain theory. Right. For Dadabai, the per capita income of an Indian during the years 1867-68 was rupees 20 to zero. This was Dadabai Naurochi's observation. You can imagine our standard, standard of life. Okay. There's a question in your PSC, you can note down that. According to Dadabai, during the years 1867-68, the per capita income of an Indian was rupees 20, okay. which shows okay, the, you know, economic distress India was experiencing at that time. Right. This all the background, there are all the reasons. This apart, you see, we have journalism, right, playing a very important role. Growth of journalism. Okay. Growth of journalism, you see, journalism means ideas, newspapers, okay, periodicals, they are very important, right? Okay for promoting consciousness, right? Consciousness, Chaitanya, right? Where actually you see the beginnings of India's press and journalism, right? Beginnings of India's journalism. Beginnings of journalism, okay? It all started with Bengal Gazette. The first journal in modern India, Bengal Gazette. See this, Bengal Gazette. Okay. <clears throat> this was the first paper, first journal in India, it was founded by James Augustus Hickey. James Augustus A-U-G-U-S T-U-S Augustus Hickey H-I-C-K-E H-I-C-K not H-I-C-K by Hickey Way back 1780, 1780 in Kolkata. Mark this. This is the first newspaper. I think you are aware of this. Printing press. First printing press was founded by the Portuguese. Portuguese in Goa. That's the first printing press. Right. Then you have Bengal Gazette, first newspaper in modern India, founded by James Augustus C.K., 1780, Kolkata. Right. After this, okay, you have important other papers. Okay. Ramohan, I told you already, Ramohan Rai, father of India journalism. Right. While discussing Ramohan Rai, I told you, Ramon founded Mirat ul Akbar, first paper in Persian, right? Bangaduta, okay. Sambandha Kaumudi, all these are Bengal gases. Okay, remember there are three Bengal gases, right? Okay. Ramon Rai also founded Bengal gases. Right. First Indian. Ramon was not the first Indian. First Indian to go to journalism, I told you this also. First Indian to go for journalism, okay. Harish Chandra Ray, he also founded the journal Bengal Gazette. 
I told you there are three Bengal gazettes, right? Bengal gazette by Harish Chandra Ray. Ray. Harish Chandra Ray, you can say the first Indian. Okay. First Indian to go for journalism. Right. Then after him, Raja Ramo. Then you have Samachar Darpan. Samachar Darpan. Samachar Darpan. D-A-R-P-A-N. Samachar Darpan. It's a, you know, first Bengali, you know, newspaper. First Bengali newspaper market very important. Samachar Darpan. This was by okay, William Carey. William W I L L A Carey C A R R E C A R E okay. This was the first newspaper in Bengali. Right. I told you Miratul Akbar, first journal in Persian by Ramon Rai. Then you see Jam A Jahan Numa. Jan A Jahan Numa. N U M. This was the first newspaper in Urdu. We don't know who founded it, right? John A. Jahan Numa. Then, after that, you see Bangaduta, I told you, by Ramohan Rai and Dwarakma Tagore. Both, both founded Bangaduta. Okay? Together founded Bangaduta by Ramohan and Dwarakma Tagore. Okay? Then, Bombay Samacha. First paper in Gujarati. Okay. We don't know who founded this also. Okay. Bombay Times. Now you call it, you know, Times of India. Okay. This was also founded. After that, okay. Rost Goktar. Very, very important. R-A-S-T. Goktar. G-O-F-T-A. Rost Goktar. It was, you see, by the Parsi intellectuals, Parsi reform movement, you remember? Rehnamai, Mazda, Asan, Sabha, I told you. Okay. This was very closely connected with that. Okay. It was by Dadabai, basically, Rastgoptar. Rastgoptar means what? Okay. The one who tells you truth. Okay. The one who speaks truth. The one who tells you truth or the one who speaks truth. This was the newspaper. Okay. You can call it as okay, a Gujarati fortnightly. First Gujarati fortnight, two weeks. Right. In Gujarati. By Dada Bhai. Right. Rashtagopta, it was founded in the year 1851. Right. Then you see Hind Patriot. Hind Patriot. Okay. That was founded by Girish Chandra Ghosh. Okay. Girish Chandra Ghosh founding Hind Patriot. Okay. Then Samprakasha. This is very important. Sam Prakash, Sam Prakash, Sam Prakash, founded by Dwaraknath Vijabhushan, Dwaraknath Vijabhushan, this is the first journal dedicated for entirely politics, totally 
politics, exclusively for politics. Okay, that is the right word. Okay, first Bengali paper to devote itself for politics. Dwarnath Vijabhushan, market very important. Some Prakash, it was founded in 1858. It was founded in the year 1858 in Kolkata. Market very important. Some Prakash, right? Next to this, some Prakash, you have Indian Mirror. Okay. Indian Mirror by Devendranath Tagore. Okay. Right. Then same Devendranath Tagore also founded National Paper. You see two journals founded by Devendranath Tagore. Indian Mirror. And National Paper. Both were founded by Devanath Tagore. Right. Mark them important. Then you see Amrit Basar Patrika, next one, very important. Amrit Bazar. Then okay, Bangadarshan, right, by Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, mark it very important. Bangadarshan. Bangaduta was by, you know, Brahmohan Rai. Bangadarshan by Bankim Chandra. Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. Okay. This newspaper very important. Why? Because you see, when you go to proper freedom struggle, you have okay, Barindra Kumar Ghosh, Jitinar Banerjee, great revolutionaries. Particularly in Aravindo. Aravindo used this journal okay, for criticizing moderate method of struggle. Okay. I will discuss when I go to extremism. Use you know, this particular journal, very important, Bangadarsha, by Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. Okay. Then, okay. after this, you have Hindu, okay, what you and I are reading today. This newspaper Hindu was founded by GSIS, The Hindu. Newspaper founded by, Hindu newspaper founded by, GSIR and Veera Raghavachari what you and I are reading the newspaper the then you see Balagangadar Tilak Chiplunkar and Agarkar okay. these three are you know, connected with the foundations of two journals. Okay. Two journals in Marathi. One is Kesari. Okay. The journal Kesari. This is in English. This is Marathi. Okay. And Maratha in English. Kesari in Marathi. and Maratha in English founded by Tilak Balangadar Tilak right. edited by Kelkar Kelkar was the editor Kelkar edited that is the question also who edited them Kelkar right. along with Tilak you have two other also Gopal Ganesh Agrakar and Chiplunkar. Okay. Gopal Ganesh Agrakar and Chiplunkar. G. G. Agrakar. A. G. R. A. K. A. Agrakar and Chiplunkar. Okay. They are also connected with the foundations of Kesari and Maratha newspapers. Right. 
then same gs ir also founded so they see mitran another newspaper by gs ir mitran by gs ir these are all important newspapers the importance of these newspapers you know okay is because of these newspapers okay lot lot of political consciousness was generated in india okay mark these newspapers very important right after newspapers you have political parties you mean freedom struggle started already before congress yes definitely there are political parties formed in british india okay india under the direct control of the british you call it as british india what were the political parties in british india okay that were responsible for freedom struggle first political party in modern india right Bengal Land Holders Society. Okay. Even though you see the before Bengal Land Holders Society, okay. Before Bengal Land Holders Society, before bengal land holders society okay you had banga bhasha banga bhasha samiti okay banga bhasha samiti of raja ram mohan rai okay but you see that was you know founded after the death of ram mohan rai okay by his close associates okay close associates of ram mohan rai they founded it they are meant, that was meant for only discussing the policies you cannot call it a political party in the real sense of the word okay. first political party in modern india you can say bengal land holders society okay. bengal land holders society this was the first political party remember after discussing while discussing 1857 revolt i told you bengal land holders society of dwaraknath tagore it tendered its apology right for the revolt it was founded in the year 1838 by dwaraknath tagore tagore right this was the first political party right after this you have british india society okay in 1839 british india society in 1839 1839 British India Society founded in 1839 by William Adams okay. William Adams A D A M S it was founded in london okay. this was founded in london okay. political parties formed in different parts of india okay. first one bangabhasha prakashika sabha 
first one we know i have given you already three i think but uh, anyway i will come okay first one banga bhasha banga bhasha banga bhasha ప్రకాశిక సభ రైట్ దిస్ వాస్ ఫౌండెడ్ ఇన్ ఎయిటీన్ థర్టీ సిక్స్ ఐ టోల్ యూ రామ్ మోహన్ రాయ్ డైడ్ ఆల్రెడీ బై ద టైమ్ ఎయిటీన్ థర్టీ ఫైవ్ రైట్ అసోసియేట్స్ క్లోజ్ ఫ్రెండ్స్ ఆఫ్ రామ్ మోహన్ రాయ్ దే ఫౌండెడ్ ఇట్ aim was to discuss the british policies and seeking redress problems to be brought to the notice of the british and all that so it's not a political party in the real sense of the word okay but definitely it discuss the problems of the indians okay this was the first organization right then you have okay second one okay bengal land holders society 1838 by dwarak nath we call it the first political party for all practical purposes next you see british india society okay it was founded in 1839 william adams london right then what are the other political parties up to this point i think right other political parties after this then british india association by dwarakna tagore was more then you see british india association by dwarakna tagore 1851 next one fourth one british india association okay this was founded by dwarakna tagore again dwarakna tagore in the year i'm sorry it was founded by devendra tagore devendra tagore in 1851 it was founded in 1851 by devendra tagore devendra tagore right kolkata right right next one you see Madras Native Association, very, very important. Madras Native Association, N-A-T-I-U, Native Association. This was founded by Gajula Lakshmi Narsimham Chetty. Gajula, G-A-J-U-L-A, Lakshmi Narsimham. See, our Andhra man, Andhra in Sistilgo man, okay. Lakshmi Narsimham. పార్టీ just as you have first political party madras native association in south india okay bombay native association see this bombay native association right this is the first political party in bombay presidency founded by jagannath shankar shet Shankar Shet Right This is the first political party Same year 1852 In a way Madras Native Association's formation Inspired okay, Inspired Jagannath Shankar Shet To found Bombay Native Association 1852 Right 
then our dada bhai grand old man of india he founded east india association in london in 1866 dada bhai he founded east india association political party east india association okay. this was founded by dada bhai in london okay. london right. you remember i told you dada bhai got elected to the parliament and labor party ticket right so east india association by dada bhai in london 1866 then in 1867 very next year mary carpenter mary carpenter biographer of ramon she founded national indian association national indian association in london right by mary carpenter mary carpenter she is a biographer and a mom right then you see very important in 1870 pune sarvajanik sabha very important pune सार्वजनिक सभा मार्केट वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट सार्वजनिक सभा दिस वॉज फाउंडेड बाई जस्टिस एम जी रनडे एम जी रनडे एंड जी वी जोशी दे फाउंडेड दिस वट इज द इम्पॉर्टेंस ऑफ पुना सार्वजनिक सभा दिस इज द प्रिकर्स of inc the okay. indian national congress you see inc founded in 1885 okay what preceded inc okay what was the precursor political party that led to the formation of inc it was pune sarvajanik sabha okay for that matter pune sarvajanik sabha made all the arrangements for the formation of indian national congress i'll tell you later okay so which was the organization okay that was responsible for the formation of inc means pune sarvajanik sabha the precursor of inc market very important right then you see in 1872 anand mohan bos anand you know anand mohan bos the great brahma samaj activist anand mohan bos okay he founded indian society a political party called indian society right this indian society in 1876 it became indian association indian association Indian Association under the leadership of Surendra Nath Banerji, very very important. Surendra Nath Banerji. Okay. Question in UPSC: What was the most dynamic political party before Congress Party? Just now told you, Congress Party was founded in 1885. Indian National Congress Party. Before the formation of Indian National Congress Party, what was the most dynamic political party? Most dynamic political party, Indian Association of Surendra Nath Banerji. Right. Very important. Right. Then you see, in 1875, before this, in 1875. Okay, I must have mentioned the date, 1875. Sisir Kumar Ghosh, remember Amrit Bazar Patrika. Sisir Kumar Ghosh, founder of Amrit Bazar Patrika. Okay. He founded. Okay. 
Indian League, a political party called Indian League. Not so important, okay, but better you note down. Indian League, that was the political party by Sishir Kumar Bose, founded in 1875. Right. Then you see, in South India, you have Madras Mahajana Sabha, Madras Mahajana Sabha, 1884, and 1885, Bombay Presidency Association. In 1884, Madras Mahajana Sabha, Mahajana Sabha, J A N A S J B H. This was founded by B. Ananda Charyulu. Ananda Charyulu. C H A R Y A Charyulu. Y U N. B. Ananda Charyulu. G S I S Subramanya Iyer. And Veera Raghava Charyu. Veera Raghav. Right. P. Anandacharyulu, G. S. I. S. and Viragavachari, these three together founded Madras Mahajan Sabha in 1884. That very next year, 1885, you had Bombay Presidency Association. Presidency. Association. Bombay Presidency Association founded by Firoz Shah Mehta. Firoz Shah Mehta. Katie Telang. Telang. T E L A N G. And Badruddin Tabji. Other thing, T Y A B J. These three together founded Bombay Presidency Association. Right. These are all the political parties founded okay. in British. Right. So you see, okay, you have political parties, organizations, and you know growth of journalism, these are all the responsible factors for the great renaissance, I mean great freedom struggle, right? Fine. Now I told you two governor generals were responsible, okay, with their contrasting, you know, policies, okay. One Lord Lytton, the other one Lord Rimpan. Okay. You remember I told you the beginnings of India's nationalist movement, Okay, it started with the contradictory policies of two governor generals. One governor general had, you know, contempt for India, Lord Lytton. His immediate successor, Lord Ripon, had, I don't say love for India, but definitely he was liberal. Right. See, the point here is that India's nationalist movement, you have to look at it also from, you know, the political parties of England, from the point of view of political parties of England. You know, in England, you have two political parties. The two political parties of England, Labour Party and Conservative Party. Okay. As and when these parties change, Governor Generals also change. Right. Just as even in our today's government system, Okay, if government you know, changes, political party changes in power at the center, your governors also change it. Likewise, conservative party, okay, when it came to power, okay, it sent its you know candidate, Lord Lytton, as governor general. Lytton representing you know conservative party. Okay, here's the conservative party, you know candidate, right? How Lytton's policy is responsible for the beginnings of nationalist movement? From the beginning, Lytton followed okay, 
an indifferent attitude, callous attitude. Okay. He was a conservative. Okay. He had no sympathy for the problems of any. You see, entire, you know, Bombay presidency was affected by 1875 Deccan famine. Deccan famine, one of the worst famines, the mm -hmm. famine, F A M I N. When entire Deccan was reeling under severe famine and people were dying okay, due to starvation, there starvation deaths also taking place. Okay. This conservative and you know indifferent governor general wasted public money. Okay. Now you see where his policies were providing ground for our nationalist movement. Lord Lytton wasting public money, okay. organized Delhi Darbar, Grand Delhi Darbar. In 1877, January 1st, okay, he organized Grand Imperial Darbar in Delhi and declared Queen Victoria the Empress of India. Okay. If you remember, I told you, after 1857 revolt, Parliament took over the administration, but Parliament did not announce the Queen officially the Empress of India. Okay. I said it was 1877, remember, January 1st. January 1st, Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria officially declared the Empress of India in the Delhi Darbar. Okay. In the Delhi Darbar by Lord Lincoln. Okay. Problem is, you see, people were facing severe, you know, financial, severe crisis, economic crisis, okay, wasting of public money, holding imperial darbar, that is objectionable. Right? This particular act of Lord Lincoln, Governor General, conducting Delhi darbar, wasting public money, came under severe criticism in the local press local press. When his act was criticized, you know, in 1878, Vernacular Press Act, okay, Vernacular Press Act, Press Act was passed by Lord Lytton. This act definitely curbing, C-U-R-B, curbing the freedom of thought and expression, okay, Vernacular Press Act, Karbudi, the freedom of thought and expression. This was definitely, you know, conservative and reactionary attitude of Lytton, suppressing the people's opinion, right? Curbing the freedom of thought and expression, right? Then you see, same Lytton sensed a threat from the Indian middle classes. I already told you, Indian educated middle classes were very dynamic. These educated Indian middle classes sitting for civil service exams. Right, by 1863, Sachin Tagore became the first ICS. Okay. Followed by Gupta. Okay. Subhash Chandra Bose secured fourth rank in the merit order. Right. Even, you know, for that matter, Srinandranath Banerjee, okay, he was also a bright, you know, aspiring, you know, candidate for civil services. Of course, he was disqualified. The point here is, Indian youth were, you know, joining the civil services. Okay. If the progressive-minded, well-educated Indian youth joining the civil services means, it may create a problem for the British administration. That's why conservative Governor General Lytton decided to discourage Indians. Okay. He wanted to stop Indians, educated Indians, getting into the services. Okay. His idea was to promote conservative sections. Who are conservative sections? Indian princely states and the Jamindas. He wanted to promote these conservative sections, princely states and Jamindas, into the civil services so that they will remain loyal. So he reduced, you see, in same year 1878, Lord Lytton reduced, reduced the upper age limit, upper age limit from 21 years to 19. Okay. You know, exam, 
it would be it it was held in london okay the practically impossible for indian civil service aspirants to go to london and to take the exam within the age 19 right this is where indian middle classes okay thoroughly disappointed with later okay remember one thing for any movement middle class leadership is very important educated middle classes were the ones who always led the movements educated middle classes dream dream was to make it into the top services now these dreams are shattered when lord lytton reduced the upper age limit from 21 to 19 okay. this a part i told you already he wanted to promote indian princes and jamindars for that he created what is called as statutory civil services statutory civil services statutory civil services means okay, reserving one fifth of the jobs one fifth of the total number of jobs total number of recruitment one fifth of the recruitments for indian princes and jamindars giving them they won't take any exam they will straight away get into the services okay reserving one fifth of the jobs of course princes and the jamindars they never joined because it's below their dignity to get into the civil service right but you see one fifth of the jobs provided for and you know indian princes and the aristocrats that was definitely against the expectations of the middle class right. same litton again okay he also passed indian arms act okay governor general lord litton passed indian arms act a r a m s arms act a r m s arms act this indian arms act prohibiting indians indians not to hold arms whereas foreigners were allowed okay europeans were allowed allowed to have their arms wear arms and to hold them right whereas indians were not allowed means what that is definitely racial discrimination right? it is discriminated so one governor general lord litton definitely disappointed indian you know educated middle classes by his conservative attitude okay, it is said blood lit and lit the flames of nationalism okay. he had lit the flames of nationalism you understand he definitely kindled the spirit of india's nationalism right so you could understand i think one governor general Lord Lytton, how he was responsible for the beginnings of nationalism by his conservative policy. Okay. His immediate successor, Lord Ripon. Okay. Lord Ripon. Okay. I told you already. Okay. Highly progressive-minded Lord Ripon. Okay. Progressive-minded and liberal Lord Ripon. Okay. He had, you know. concern for india undoubtedly introduced certain liberal reforms i don't say that that he did it for promoting nationalism but you see it's a policy of labor party he was the governor general of the labor party sent by the labor party okay. so his policies okay, they were definitely liberal what were these policies if you remember i told you by 1881 okay the first indian uh, you know indian factory act was passed indian factory act this was the first indian factory act right this act i told you it addressed the problems of women labor child labor right definitely a liberal you know act right i told you in yesterday's class right this act 
you know, prohibited children below seven years to be employed as labor in the factories, provided them okay, four holidays okay, in a month, okay, better living conditions and wages all were there as per the act. Right? Then you see in 1882, okay, Lord Ripon revoked the Vernacular Press Act. Okay. Vernacular Press Act of Lord Lytton, which curbed the freedom of thought and expression, was revoked. It was withdrawn by Lord Ripon, restoring freedom of thought and expression. Right. Then in the same year, 1882, Lord Ripon appointed okay, W. W. Hunter Committee. Okay. When I go to education policy, I'll tell you later. Hunter Committee, W. W. Hunter. Okay. Hunter Committee was for studying primary education. What was the problem of primary education in modern India? For that, Hunter Committee was appointed. Okay. Hunter Committee, okay, it recommended for privatization of education. See, in the education system, primary education is very important. Right? After 1857 revolution, British were not bothered. British had not, you know, taken any interest, any interest okay, in okay, in promoting the education in modern. Particularly, primary education was neglected. Primary education is very important. So, Hunter Committee. You call Hunter Committee. The first Indian Education Commission, very important. First Indian Education Commission. Education Commission. Right. This recommended for privatization of education. Because government was not in a position to provide education for all. But all said and done, a sympathetic act to promote primary education in modern India. Then in the same year again, in 1882, okay, Lord Lytton okay, provided compulsory grants, very, very important. In the budget, compulsory grants. Compulsory grants for autonomous bodies, municipalities, Gram panchayats and you know jilla parishads, okay. local self-governing bodies, compulsory grants were provided for local self-governing bodies. Okay. For this particular reason, okay, compulsory grants for local self-governing bodies, you call Lord Ripon, father of modern local self-governments. Very, very important. Lord Ripon called father of modern local self-governing bodies. Why he provided compulsory grants, try to understand. For municipalities, jilla parishads, and the village panchayats. It's because, you see, after 1857 revolt, right, Queen made a promise that she would promote Indians in the art of decision making. This remained merely as a promise, right? How to promote Indians in the decision making process? Top level of administration completely manned by the British. We have our Indian officers at the lower level, particularly panchayat, municipalities, and jilla parishads. You have Indian, you know, Indians working, Indian admin, administration manned by Indians. If you are strengthening panchayats, municipalities, and jilla parishads, means Definitely you are strengthening, you know, Indians in the administration. Okay. That's why compulsory grants were provided for the local bodies. It was for this particular reason we call Ripon the father of modern local self-government. Right. Then you see in 1883, Lord Ripon ventured into a, you know, quite an adventurous exercise, I should say. Okay. No governor general ever dared to touch that particular issue. Now, Ripon decided to handle that issue. What is that? 
if you remember, if you remember, I told you it was T.B. Macaulay. T.B. Macaulay introduced rule of law. For the first time, Macaulay introduced rule of law and equality before law with his regulation 11. Remember? Okay. All acts were called regulations. Regulation Roman figure 11 of T.B. Macaulay. Okay. With this, you see, rule of law and equality before law were introduced. Okay. While discussing lower caste movements, I mentioned this also. Okay. But never, you know, equality was, you know, established. Even today you don't have absolute equality. So, okay, you can't expect it. But definitely there's lot, lot of discrimination there in spite of rule of law and equality before law. In dispensing the justice, right? What was the problem? Problem was this. English judges could preside over the courts, trialing the Indian criminals. Follow this carefully. Indian judges, you know, English judges could preside over English judges, white. White judges could preside over the courts trialing Indian criminals. Whereas, whereas, you see this, whereas Indian judges shall not preside over, Indian judges shall not preside over the courts trialing the white criminals. For instance, you are a white. The English man, you have committed a crime. Okay. Indian judge shall not to prosecute you. You would only be prosecuted by white judge. So if judges are whites and criminals are whites, where is the scope here for, you know, justice to prevail? Right. There is a trial of jury. Trial of jury means you have five judges, right, constituting as a Jury, right? Jury. If these five judges were English, whites, and criminal white, okay, where is justice to prevail here? White versus white. Whereas white judges versus blacks, I mean Indians, okay, punishments were very severe, even for small offenses. Okay. So to you know end this small practice in the to end the this discrepancy, this, you know, uh, you know, practice in judiciary, okay. Lord Ripon okay, wanted to introduce a new act. A bill was a proposal on that called Ilbert Bill. Ilbert, okay, it was named after Ilbert. Ilbert was the law member okay, in the council of Governor General's Executive Council, right? Gilbert was the law member. So he came out with the bill on the, you know, instructions of Governor General. That bill is called Gilbert Bill. Now, Gilbert Bill, what is the controversy? See the controversy. Gilbert Bill provided for Indian judges also to constitute as jury. Indian judges could also be the members of the jury, try the white criminals. This is Gilbert Bill. This was definitely to uphold rule of law and equality before law. Governor General Ripon knew, knew that British would definitely go against it. But he was prepared, prepared to face the you know protest from the British. As expected, when the bill was introduced. All the Europeans, the whites, British, you see, they all came together okay, against the bill. For them, whites are whites, blacks are blacks. Right. So, there is some movement from within the administration against the bill, Ilbert bill. Okay. English wanted to maintain their identity as whites. So much pressure was built upon Lord Ripon. And he had to go for amending the bill. Okay. Now you see, 
the amended bill ilvat bill was amended and passed on you see very important january 25th january 25th 1884 ilvat bill was passed okay. with great protest you understand okay from the indian leadership when ilvat bill was amended and introduced there are series of movements protest movements all over british india okay ilvat bill definitely united the indian public opinion it exposed the true nature of british racial arrogance arrogance and less racial discrimination tremendous political activity started against ilvat bill controversy okay it was the major event that united the people now come to the point you see the importance of january january 25th 1884 ilbert bill was passed in the evening right january 26 you see this is very important the very next day january 26 okay i already told you surendranath banerji most vocal leader in the indian politics okay for as he was surendranath banerji for the british they called him surrender not start surendana surendana okay. if you remember i just now told you surendana denachi founded indian association right most dynamic political party before congress party now surendana gave a slow you know call he gave a call for all the political parties to assemble to assemble in the white hall kolkata white hall a public place right white hall kolkata okay in protest against in protest against the amended ilbert bill okay. so you are understanding the sanctity of january 26th january 26th if you remember okay, in the lahore session 1929 in congress session 1929 we had passed a resolution right to celebrate january 26th every year as independence day not a public day independence day. once constitution was drafted after we getting independence we made it republic day right actually it was to be celebrated as every year independence day why january 26 this is the sanctity of january 26 my dear on that particular day okay, a call was given by surendranath banerji for all the political parties to come together in the fight against amended ilbert bill this marked the beginnings of india's nationalism clear now you could understand you can i have given you the answer for the question how two governor generals were responsible one governor general tried to suppress everything nationalistic the other governor general now you know in a way he promoted everything nationalist okay then amended ilbert bill what does it say i have not discussed that amended ilbert bill says that indians could also be the members of the jury indian judges could also be the members of the jury but they shall not constitute majority okay indian judges shall not constitute majority i told you five judges so as per the amended bill maximum number of two indian judges two indian judges would be appointed three would be english so majority decision would prevail is as good as that you have not given representation for the indian judges there no point right so the bill was amended and passed against the very spirit of the so ilbert bill controversy generated enough political you know consciousness right these are all okay. the you know developments before the formation of the indian congress right i told you this all the background these are all the factors okay. yes then how the congress party was formed congress party was formed okay. now i told you everything was 
getting ready under the leadership of Sunendranath Dhananji. The problem is if political parties come together under the leadership of Sunendranath Dhananji, it would be difficult for the British to handle. I told you the reason. Sunendranath was a man with great, you know, caliber, intellectual caliber and a highly vocal leader, very dynamic leader. Now, how to stop this? Okay. That's why, you see, Evo Hume entered into the picture. I am not telling you that it was a clear plan on the part of the British, but definitely, okay, Hume was requested by Governor General Dufferin. Okay. When Congress party was founded, who was the Governor General? Dufferin. Dufferin was the government. Okay. Now Evo Hume, he took the lead. Who was this man Evo? Alexander Octavian Hume, okay. retired ICS officer. Now he entered into the picture. He negotiated with, I mean he consulted, consulted with different political parties. It's mainly because of his efforts that political parties of India and different political parties of India decided to come together. Okay. Decided to come together. And you see, Pune Sarvajanik Sabha made the arrangements. Arrangements. So finally, on December 28, 1885, December 28, 1885, due to the efforts of Pune Sarvajanik Sabha, and Evo Hume, right? Evo Hume, right? At Satej Paul Sanskrit College. Tej Paul Sanskrit College. Sanskrit College. Bombay. Seventy two delegates from different political parties. 72 delegates from different political parties assembled right, assembled in the Tej Paul Sanskrit. It was in this session, Bombay session, 1885, December 28 to 31st that INC, Indian National Congress was founded. I mean Congress Party was founded. This name Indian National Congress was suggested, very important. This name was given by Dada Bhai. It was Dada Bhai who gave the name okay, Indian National Congress, right, INC. Evo Hume, the man who took the initiative, we call him the founder father, founder father of the Congress party. Hume was the general secretary. From 18, not, 1885 to 1905, Hume acted as the general secretary of the Congress party. So Hume, the man, founder father of the Congress party. So Congress party finally took a concrete form and a shape. Right. Now you see the freedom struggle, the first stage of the freedom struggle starts. Remember our entire freedom struggle divided, divided into three phases or three stages. You call it, you know, by the names, age of moderates, age of moderates. Age of moderatism from 1885 to 1905. Okay. Moderates. From 1885 to 1905, three stages. I am giving you three stages. Number one, first stage, age of moderates. Moderatism. In Telugu, you call it Mitavadam, Mitavadi, right? Age of moderates or moderatism, 1885 to 
1905 for 20 years. Next, age of extremism or you can call it as militant nationalism. 1905 to 1980. Right. Third, Gandhian era. Right. Now you are entering into the first stage of the nationalist called Age of Moderatives. Remember, ever since Congress Party was founded, I mean 1885, it was completely dominated by the so called moderates. Why you call them moderates? I'll discuss that later. In Indian nationalist movement, okay, you see you have different types of leaders. You call a particular leader moderate, extremist, revolutionary and all that. Going by three things. Remember this is very important. The three things, number one, ideology, three criteria. Ideology, okay, number one. Number two, method of struggle. Method, method of struggle. Next, number three, okay, objectives. Okay. So I am giving you three criteria. Remember, on the basis of these three criteria, number one, ideology. Number two, method of struggle. Next, number three, objectives. On the basis of these three, we will decide the type of leadership, whether a particular leader is moderate or a extremist or revolutionary or socialist like that. I will discuss moderate ideology, method of struggle and objectives later. Now you see Congress party was for, like just now I told you, Bombay session, 1885. Remember that first session was presided over by W.C. Banerjee, Umesh Chandra Banerjee. Okay. Umesh Chandra Banerjee, you see the senior most of the 72. That's why he was made the president, number one. Okay. Second important thing is, a tradition started in the Congress party that the president must not be from the local area. This all to promote more, you know, national unity and all that. Okay. About to rise above the regional considerations. Okay. First session held in Bombay. W.C. Banerjee from Bengal. So president shall not be a local candidate. This tradition also started with this particular session. Like. So, you see, when Congress party was formed in Bombay, with Bombay session, 1885, okay. there you see all the great early nationalist leaders. You call them all moderates. Early nationalist leaders, Gokale, Gopalakrishna Gokale, head of the moderate wing, right? I'll tell you later, moderatism means. Gopal, Gokale, okay, Justice M.G. Ranade, K. Dinshavacha, Badruddin Tavji, Firosha Mehta, K. T. Talang, Ambika Charan Machundar, Ananda Mohan Bose, all were moderates. Understand? Dadawai. They are all moderate. They are moderate leaders. Their ideology, method of struggle, and objectives. Now come to the point. Why you call them moderates? I told you, ideology, method of study, and objectives. Right. Who, first of all, talks about the ideology, method of study, and objectives? It all you see by Gokale. 
ಗೋಪಾಲ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಗೋಖಲೆ ಹೆಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಮಾಡರೇಟ್ ಮೀ ಗೋಖಲೆ ಚೀಫ್ ಐಡಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಮಾಡರ್ ಗೋಖಲೆ ಇಫ್ ರಿಮೆಂಬರ್ ಐ ಟೋಲ್ ಯು ನಸ್ಟೆಸ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಫೌಂಡೆಡ್ ದಿ ಜರ್ನಲ್ ಸುಧಾರಕ್ ಸುಧಾರಕ್ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರೆಸ್ ಸೇಮ್ ಸುಧಾರ ಟೈಟಲ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಅನದರ್ ಜರ್ನಲ್ ಆಲ್ಸ್ ಫೌಂಡೆಡ್ ಬೈ ಗೋಪಾಲ ಗಣೇಶ್ ಅಗ್ರಕಾರ್ ದಟ್ ಸುಧಾರಕ್ ವಾಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ಸೋಷಲ್ ರಿಫಾರ್ಮ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸುಧಾರಕ್ ಟಾಕ್ಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಪೊಲಿಟಿಕಲ್ ಆಕ್ಟಿವಿಟಿ ಗೋಖಲೆ ನೋಟ್ ಡೌನ್ ಅನದರ್ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಗೋಖಲೆ ಹಿ ವಾಸ್ ಸೋ ನ್ಯಾಷನಲಿಸ್ಟ್ ಹಿ ರಿಜೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ದಿ ಬ್ರಿಟಿಷ್ ನೈಟ್ ಹೋಮ್ and even refused to join council of you know secretary of state for india remember these things apsc gave a question the indian leader who rejected knighthood k n i g h t knighthood means it's a reward right it's an honor conferred honor conferred not reward honor conferred okay. gokale rejected knighthood k n i g g h t Gokhale rejected knighthood given by the British. An offer was made to him to be the member of the, you know, Secretary of State for India's Council, Indian Council. He rejected both. Okay. That way, highly nationalistic Gokhale. Gokhale, in his general Sudharak, talks about moderatism. I told you the moderate leaders, right? Their background, what was their background? their background these leaders came from upper middle class of the indian society elite they are aristocratic they are elite elitist i mean indian educated middle class okay. educated middle class is the leaders you know they, they, they were the ones who provided the leadership right? moderates most of them they came from educated indian middle class upper strata of the society well really educated top brass of the society aristocrats you have landlords you have capitalists right industrialists in this particular you know group moderates that way they were the allied section of the indian society this is the background now what does gokhale say okay. moderatism and its ideology now i am giving you the ideological aspects of moderates why you call them moderates we call them moderates because of their ideology right first to begin then what are the ideological aspects of moderatism ideological aspects of moderatism number 1 okay unflinching loyalty to the english moderates always followed a policy of loyalty extending loyalty to the british why extending loyalty to the british why they remained loyal to the british is because you see for the moderates british very powerful in india all the movements against the british failed so indian leaders say must remain loyal to the english because they are powerful no movement proves successful against them this is the first important idea of moderates second important idea of moderates for moderates english became the rulers of india in the good interests of india for moderates british the rulers of india rulers of india okay. this is in the good interests of india rulers of india in the good interests of the india what do you mean by this it means you see we are very lucky for moderates indians very lucky to have 
British as the rulers. Why? Why? Because England, mother of parliamentary ideas and institutions. Right? England, mother of parliamentary ideas and institutions, undoubtedly. Way back 1215, 1215, England gave the world Magna Carta. England gave the world, you know, petition of rights, bill of rights. These are all, you know, what finally the strong pillars of democracy. England, undoubtedly the first democratic country, most democratic, right, from the beginning. Okay. So for moderates, we are very lucky to have English as the rulers because English for democracy, liberal. Okay. In other words, moderates believe that England would transform India into democratic country. Moderates expected that England would introduce parliamentary ideas and institutions in India and they would transform India into democratic country. That's why they advocated loyalty to the English. Right. Next, number three, they believed in only cooperation. Moderates believed in cooperation. Right. No confrontation. Okay. Why only cooperation? Obviously, English is very powerful. When they are powerful, for moderates, when enemy is powerful, better you cooperate with enemy okay, than confronting the enemy. If you go for confrontation means you are welcoming a problem. So moderates work for cooperation. By, you know, cooperation, they wanted to secure the interests of India. Get the interests of India interest. Okay. No place for confrontation because English too powerful. Right. Next, number four. Okay. For moderates, there is no clash. I am giving you very important things about moderate ideology. Okay. For moderates, no clash between India's nationalism. and British imperialism or British colonialism. For moderates, okay. no clash, no clash between, no clash between nationalism and British colonialism. Why no clash? It's because you see this. For moderates, Development of England, very important. Development of England meant development of India. Are you understanding? Why you call them moderates? Because they believe that if England develops, means that would be the development of India. Don't entertain any other ideas. Just accept moderates as they are their ideology. For them, okay, no clash between okay, India's nationalism and British colonialism because development of England would be the development of India. If you develop very well, it would be my development. Then where is clash between you and I? Okay. This is why they are called moderates. In other words, moderates could never understand that development of England would be development of England only. It will not be development of India. Okay. So they believe that colonialism and nationalism, they are not contradictory. They are complementary. Okay. No clash between nationalism and British colonialism. That's why they are moderates. Next important thing is, you call them moderate because okay, they, they, they were highly, they were highly, okay, Videshi, I mean westernized. They were Videshi. Okay. What do you mean by Videshi? Moderates, they are great admirers of English language. English language, customs, traditions, right? British, you know, Western culture. Okay. They were Videshi in their outlook. That's why they are moderate. 
times. Okay. They are also moderates because they never believe in revolutionary methods. Okay. Moderates ideology, okay, no place for revolutionary change. Okay. For moderates, any change to last long must be gradual. G R A D U A L. Why you call them moderate? Because they always believed in gradual change. Gradual change. No sudden change, no revolutionary change. Why gradual change? Why because you see anything to last for long must be gradual. For moderates, anything to remain, anything to remain long. Okay. to you know remain for longer period of time it must come gradually for moderates sudden changes come suddenly and go suddenly go away suddenly okay. revolutionary change means what sudden change these sudden changes take place suddenly and go away suddenly right. so change must long remain longer means it must be gradual right that's why they are called moderates they always believed in gradual change this is moderate ideology ideological aspects now go to the second point what is the second thing their method of struggle method of struggle what is moderate method of struggle moderate method of struggle is what is called okay, constitutional means of agitation very important i am explaining these things try to understand they are very important constitutional constitutional means of agitation right constitution means our constitution generally you come across this you know phrase constitution means our constitution constitution what is meant by constitution means our constitution what is the constitution means of agitation means in the words of gokale you see in the words of gokale anything and everything except to three okay are you understanding constitution means of agitation means except to three what are these three except except three things what are these except three number 1 okay passive resistance p a s s i v e passive resistance what is passive resistance passive resistance means non cooperation okay you should never go for non cooperation no passive resistance woof woof why because you are you know a citizen you have responsibility towards the state okay if citizens go against the state okay with non cooperation that is unconstitutional so non cooperation or passive resistance passive resistance means non cooperation is unconstitutional okay that way it is not constitutional means of agitation second one is okay popular means i am explaining these things try to understand popular means m e a n what is meant by popular means of agitation popular means of agitation means you should not go for strikes okay. strikes hurtles demonstrations when you go for strikes hurtles and demonstrations what will happen you are paralyzing the state right paralyzing the administration that is not acceptable don't ever you know create a problem to the state 
don't ever create a problem for the administration. Okay. So, popular means is not acceptable. Popular means means organizing strikes, hurtals and demonstrations. Okay. Third thing is what? Sedition. What is sedition? Conspiracy against the men of the state, the men at the helm of the affairs. For instance, you have ministers, heads of the states. You should not ever okay, plan for killing them, assassinating them, you understand. That means sedition. You should not do these three. What are the three? Passive resistance, popular means and sedition. Do anything except these three. Okay. Except these three. It comes under constitutional means of constitution. In other words, I am telling you further. Constitutional means of agitation means, get this point clear. Constitutional means of agitation means, okay, seeking solution, okay, finding solution or seeking solution to the problem. Solution to the problem within the framework of the constitution. Are you understanding? Seeking solution or finding solution to the problem within the framework of the constitution. Okay. Within the framework of the constitution. Within the framework. What does the constitution say? Do it. What does the constitution say? Follow it. Don't go against constitution. This is what is called constitutional means of agitation, right? Seeking solution within the framework of the constitution. Right? In other words, in the language, again, you see in other words, in the language of Bipin Chandra, Bipin Chandra, constitutional means of agitation means, means number one petition, petition, prayer and protest. Petition, prayer and protest. Okay. Go for petition. You have a problem, right? Draft a petition. Okay. Then pray. Okay. If nothing happened, you can only go up to protest. Okay. You should not go beyond the protest. For a moderate, protest itself is extreme. Understand? That's why moderate method of struggle is called petition, prayer and protest. Okay? This is method of struggle. Then what are the objectives? Moderates, you see their objectives. Okay. They wanted expansion of legislative councils. Okay. I will discuss that under Congress party agenda. Okay. Moderate method of, you know, moderates objectives, more representation for Indians. Right. This more representation also includes okay, expansion of legislative councils. Right. Okay. And you know, representation of Indians in Governor's General's Executive Council and Indian Council in London. Okay. That's what's meant by more representation, meaningful representation. Meaningful representation means what? Okay. Indian representatives must have the right to ask questions, discuss and debate. You remember? I told you 1861 Indian Council's Act, it provided for nominating, right? Nominating eight members, minimum eight, maximum twelve Indian members. They have the right to represent the problem, but no right to discuss and vote. They, they have no right to discuss and vote. Now, moderates wanted okay, that this representation should be made meaningful. Otherwise, it's a meaningless representation. Okay. Meaningless representation, right? They are simply representing the problem. No, 
right to ask question or right to discuss means what for the representation. Right. So moderates objectives, expansion of legislative councils, meaningful representation, I mean the right to ask questions, discuss, debate and vote and all that. Then you also see moderates wanted, separation of power, okay. See in the British administration, power is concentrated, right. At the district level you have collector enjoying both judicial powers and magisterial revenue powers and judicial, right. So moderates wanted separation, separation of power between judiciary and revenue administration, right. They also wanted the age relaxation. Okay, earlier you remember, I told you Lytton reduced the upper age limit from 21 to 19. Okay. They wanted that a relaxation be given for Indian civil service aspirants. And they also wanted exams to be conducted, civil service exams to be conducted at a time, both in England and in India at a time. They also wanted tax reduction, okay. a reduction in the land tax. Okay. and export duties, right? They also wanted a reduction of expenditure, military expenditure. Why unnecessarily wasting the revenues of India and military expenditure? So these are all moderates, grievances and the objectives, right? But remember very importantly, most important objective, ultimate aim of the moderate was self-governance self-governance. Okay. Moderates finally wanted self-governance. What do you mean by self-governance? Be very careful. This is all, you know, highly confusing things, okay, giving us wrong interpretations sometimes, okay, wrong, you know, perceptions sometimes. Whether it was self-governance or Swaraj, please understand. Both of them don't mean total independence. Never moderate ask for total independence. Even extremists also, let me tell you, okay, they were not for at that particular point of time total independence. Okay. Independent India, completely free from British. No one asked. What do you mean by self-governance then? Self-governance means, I am giving you this definition, see this. Self-governance means Indians governing themselves. Indians governing themselves. Themselves under the guidance of the British. Under the guidance of the British. This is what is called self -governance. So are you understanding? Okay. You British, you are very well experienced in the art of administration. We are Indians, we had no experience. So you kindly guide us. Whatever the way you guide us, we will follow it. Okay. And we must come to a point of governing ourselves under your leadership. Right? That is self-governance. Self-governance means, you see, Indians governing themselves under the guidance of the British. This is self this is the ultimate objective of a moderate. Clear? Then, okay. what was the reaction of the British? Fine, Congress party was founded. What was the reaction of the British? I told you, when Congress party was founded, it was different. Governor General was different. Governor General Dufferin. And Secretary of State, 
Secretary of State, you remember, the highest officer in charge of Indian administration. You don't see secretary in India, he would be in London. Secretary of State was Lord Cross, C-R-O-S-S, -S, Lord Cross. These two, they welcomed the formation of Indian National Congress Party. Okay. For them, Indian National Congress Party, INC, would be, you see, not a party of politicians, would be a party of more academicians, academicians, who are ready to discuss the problems of Indian society. They are not for demanding, they are only for representing the problem. So, for British, it's a mixed reaction, I am telling you. Right expression? Mixed reaction. On one hand, they are welcoming, welcoming the formation of the Congress party. Because they wanted a party exactly like that. A party which would be of academicians and they would be busy in discussing okay, and passing resolutions, not demanding. Only discussion, not demand. So, British were very much, you know, happy with a party like this. But at the same time, they had their own doubts. How long Congress party would remain loyal to the English? That's the question. That's why I said it was a mixed reaction. On one hand, they are welcoming. At the same time, they had their own doubts. That's why it's a mixed reaction. We call this policy of the English, okay, English reaction as carrot and stick policy. And stick. What is carrot and stick policy? Carrot and stick policy means English will allow Congress party to function the extent it will not create a problem to them. Okay. Any problem coming from Congress side, they will not hesitate to, to use force. Stick means force. Carrot means, you see, whatever they want to give, they will give you. You have to accept it. Anything that you want to access that's not acceptable to English, then they will use force. That's what's called carrot and stick policy. In other words, Congress party to function within the framework described by the English. This is the reaction of the Congress, no British. Right. Then what were the politics okay. and how moderates conducted themselves, moderate politics. When it comes to moderate politics, I told you, Moderates were very loyal to the English, right? All the Congress party annual sessions, you remember? December 28th to 31st, every year December, right? Annual sessions would take place. These annual sessions would start with the prayers addressed to Queen, right? And the prayers addressed for the well-being of Governor General, Secretary of State for India and all. That means our leaders very, very loyal to the English. Right? Second important thing is, for the first session of the Congress party, right? remember Bombay session, actually it was to have been presided over by Lord Grey. Okay? Congress party invited Lord Grey, Governor of Bombay. Right? Lord Grey, he was to have been the president. He should have presided over the, he, he would have, you know, presided over the first session. But you see, he had his own preoccupations. He could not turn. That's why W.C. Banerjee became the president. Our Congress party first wanted governor of Bombay to preside over. But you see in the last moment, Srinandarana Banerjee became the first. At every stage, Indian leaders were expressing their loyalty to the English. Okay. 
and every Congress party's annual session would end up okay, with the Tea Party. Okay, Tea Party. Okay, given by the British in honor of the Congress delegates, delegates, you no know, delegates and all that. Right. Then where actually differences started? For the first time, you see differences started between English and the Congress Party with the 1887 Madras session. Madras session, Chennai, of INC, the 1887. This was presided over by Badruddin Tabji. Very important. Badruddin Tabji, the first Indian Muslim, okay, mark it very important, first Indian Muslim president, Muslim president of the Congress party, okay, first Muslim president, Madras session, okay, 1887, Badruddin Tabji. It was in this session, Madras session, President Badruddin Tabji, okay, in his presidential address, mentioned the word self-governance. Self-governance for the first time mentioned by Badruddin in his presidential address. I already told you what's meant by self-governance. When the word self-governance was mentioned, Dufferin was very sharp in criticizing Congress Party. Governor General Dufferin criticized Congress Party as microscopic minority. Microscopic minority. Microscopic minority not competent to demand for self-governance. Okay. This is the question in civils who criticize the Congress party as microscopic minority not competent to demand for self-governance. Okay. It was Lord Dufferin criticizing Congress party. Right. When you see Congress party was criticized, I told you moderates were only for loyalty. That's why you see very next session, 1888 Allahabad session. Allahabad session of INC was presided over by George Yu. George Yu, the first English man to preside over. First English. Englishman to preside over the INC in charge. Right. Then you see 1889. Okay. 1889 session was held. 1889, it was in that session. Okay. A decision was taken okay. to constitute. Okay. Right to constitute okay. one consultative country. Okay. You see 1889 Bombay session, very, very important. Okay. Bombay session, it was in this session. Okay. A Congress committee was to be constituted. Okay. Constituted Okay, to represent the problems of India in London, right? There in London, you have one committee to be constituted. Okay. Indian Consultative Committee or Indian Congress Committee, you can call it as. Okay. Indian Congress Committee. This Congress committee, Indian Congress committee, okay, it was presided over by Sir William Wedderburn. Okay. 
Sir William Wedderburn Right. There is a question on this. Okay. Who was, you know, connected with, you know, Indian Congress Committee? It was Sir William Wedderburn, okay. 1889, Bombay Station. Okay. Important. This Congress Committee will represent the problems of India, okay, and the Congress leadership in London. Then 1890 session was held in Kolkata. 1890 Kolkata session. Okay. This Kolkata session was presided over by okay. Pirosha Mehta. Right. Importance of this session okay, was that for the first time you see woman participation. Okay. Okay. Kadambini Ganguli. Okay. Kadambini. Kadambini Ganguli. She is the first woman graduate to address the Congress party. Kadamini Ganguli, first graduate to address the Congress Party in 1890 session. Okay. Firoz, you know, Kolkata session. Before this, I told you, okay, William Wedder Bird, okay, presided over the Bombay session, right? He was the president for the Bombay session and was also connected with Indian Congress Committee, right? After this, you see, Another important one was the 1896 session, 1896, Kolkata session again. Eighteen ninety six Kolkata session. This was decided for by Rahim Tullah. Rahim Tullah Sayani. S A Y A Sayani. Kolkata okay. session. Importance of this session is okay, it was in this session Bande Mataram was sung by Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. You know, Bankim Chandra composed the novel Anandamat. Next chapter is that only. We will discuss that. Okay. In that novel Anandamat, Bankim Chandra okay, composed this song, okay, Vande Mataram. This song, Vande Mataram, was recited, recited for the first time okay, by Bankim Chandra Chatterjee okay, in the 1896 Kolkata session. Market important. Okay. Then you see the other sessions are not that much important. Okay. They are important sessions. What can you make out of these developments? I have given you important sessions, INC sessions, okay, under the age of modernity. In all these sessions, you see Congress party expressing its loyalty. Loyalties to the British. What did the Congress party gain? Okay. In other words, you make a critical appraisal of modernities. Excellent area for short note question in the mains exam. Gender studies mains. You can definitely get a short note question on this. Okay. A critical appraisal of critical appraisal of moderates in the freedom story. This I will be discussing tomorrow. So that you can go to the next chapter, extremism. Right. We can club the two. Moderatism where actually problems started and I mean failures of moderates then what are the achievements also there are definitely achievements to their credit it's because of their failure you see the rise and growth of extremism in Indian politics all this will be discussed